All right, today is the day, and we have finished our last control arm for the suspension. Now with that last control arm, we're going to take a look today at the entire setup and the geometry of the suspension system. So I hope you're interested in how I arrived at those things and how it's going to all go together. So let's go take a look at it. Now, I'm certainly no expert at this, but I'm a good student of the internet and of good books. And my humble knowledge started with a book called Competition Car Suspension by Alan Stansforth. And like I've said, I'm not claiming this is a tutorial, but I'm just documenting what I'm doing. So if you find it useful and see how I solve the problems, then perhaps this will be of help in building your own suspension setup. Or just entertainment and seeing what's going on out here in the fab world. So first off, in a project like this, it's sometimes easier to find components off an existing car. Now, being a mid-engine creation, one might look at something similar. But the expense, even from salvage vehicles, is kind of high. So the next option is a more mass-produced variety of vehicles, such as the MR2 or Fiero. But I have a very low deck lid over the rear, so McPherson strut suspension may or may not have worked very well. You can take a front-wheel drive setup and shift it to the rear. That's what they did with the Fiero anyway. But still, I want more control over things. My all-wheel drive setup is going to complicate this option. The next step then is to define the parameters and the goals of what you need to achieve. So here's what I was looking at. Since this is a prototype, I want everything adjustable so that I can fine tune the suspension by weight, balance, ride, maybe even aerodynamics. So my first thing is one adjustable toe, caster, camber, ride height, anti-sway, spring rate. Number two was spring rate. I need parts to be symmetrical so that I can fabricate them and build them easily. Number three, easily available parts like for the bushings, rod ends, ball joints, bearings, rotors, things like that. And number four, accessibility. And although accessibility is more of a function of the bodywork, it's still something to consider when deciding placement of the bolts and the fasteners and such. Now on with the layout. With my wheelbase being about 100 inches, and being a well-balanced mid-engine car. I'm in a range where there is some low polar moment of inertia, meaning the heavy parts of the car are all close to the center of gravity and prone for more oversteer. Now this is good as I like a bit of oversteer rather than under. With this in mind, my first focus of attention is going to get the roll center at a proper height and slightly lower because I have a few components, the engine being one of the main ones, that sit slightly higher than I would have liked. Now the roll center is a point or a line through the center of the car in which as the car goes through a turn, the weight of the car rolls about the center. It's different than the center of gravity as the suspension forces the momentum around this point. It can be found, or should I say it can be forced to a certain point by drawing an imaginary line through the pivot points of the control arm, upper and lower, then drawing another line from that junction point where those lines meet back to the center of the tire or the contact patch. Where that line crosses the center line of the car, that point is the roll center. In our case, it's about three and a half inches in the front or seven inches in the rear. With the upper and the lower tubes of my box subframe, I'm able to locate that pick a point at different heights to set this roll center. The next point I'll mention is scrub patch. This is the difference between the center line of the tire that contacts the ground and the radius of the tire rotation about where the ball joints are going to meet and can be changed, or I say, I should say it can't be changed because it's kind of a design factor of the hub. A little scrub patch gives good steering feedback and too much creates tire wear and heavy steering. Now, speaking of steering, there are two factors that come into play that we need to consider, bump steer and Ackerman. First off, bump steer is the effect you get when the wheel moves through an arc of travel when going over a bump. Isn't that cute? Bump steer. What causes this is that the tie rod pushes against the hub as it goes through that arc because the pivot point of the steering is different than the pivot of the A-arms. So to correct this, we need to make sure that the pivot point of that tie rod coming off the steering rack is in a line that follows between the top A-arm 
and the bottom of my arm's pivot point. So if the steering pivot point is in that same line, then it will create no bump steer in that arc of travel. Thus, when the suspension goes through its travel, the tie rod follows the same hinge movement rather than shortening or lengthening the steering on its own. Ackerman is similar in that when you steer left or right, the geometry of the suspension can cause the tires to point in different directions of the arc. Or rather, we want them to point slightly different. We want the arc length to be different on the inner tire than on the outer tire, because that inner tire will be turning less than the outer tire as it goes through a turn. If the tie rod connections were arbitrarily placed for convenience, then you'd likely find that the wheels point parallel when you make a steering turn. This is of course not what we want. We want them to fall in a line that originates at the center of the rear axle and travels through the front hub pivot points. Now if the tie rod attaches anywhere along this line, you will get the differential of steering the rear rafter. As you can see, it would have been a lot easier to locate the tie rod end connections here. But our differential and drive shaft and the push rods are all in the way, so we're going to have to locate it here. Right in the magical Ackerman line, and on the plane of the ball joint that we talked about above. It's kind of tight against the hub. Without much lever arm, it's going to make it a little harder to steer. But I'm going to be using an electric steering assist system. And hope to build a controller that will assist it in parking and low speeds and then just turn itself off at higher speeds. The last thing we could discuss is the coil of replacement and the anti-sway bar design. But I'm going to leave it a little bit of suspense and cover those things as we build those components and start mounting them on the subframe. In closing, I'll just let you take a look over some of the design targets that I'm shooting for. And we'll see how close we get to those as we start to build the car. And once it hits the road, we start doing some tuning. Well, there's a little overview of our entire suspension design and setup. There are some things that weren't included in that that we talked about in other videos. I'm going to put a link up right here that covers why I switched from the castings to these uh, welded metal parts. Another video I'll put here kind of covers the front subframe and how we had some clearance problems with the steering. And there's some others out there that you can go and see. But I hope you enjoyed this video. We're glad you stopped by to see this one and hope you come back and see us again.